If you would open your Bibles to the book of Lamentations, um, we'll begin our, our study together. As I said, we'll spend the next five weeks looking at this Old Testament book. Uh, we were going to take a break from Matthew. Sometimes as you're walking through a particular book of the Bible, it's good to just kind of take a break for uh, a few weeks. And so I thought, let's, let's hit pause. And what we decided to do, uh, really I decided to do, was to look at the book of Lamentations. And the reason for that is when we look at Matthew chapter 13, which we just finished, uh, there are some striking, uh, what feels often like forceful words of Jesus, warnings, exhortations. Uh, actually, in verses in chapters thir- um, 11 through 13, these woes that he preaches, and then they kind of accumulate in, in chapter 13. It's, it's nice in verse 43 where he says that the righteous will shine like stars. That's a very nice thought and idea. But the, the verse preceding that is that the unrighteous will be thrown into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then later in verses 49 and to 49.50, he tells those who he's listening to that the angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous, and the wicked will be thrown into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and there will be gnashing of teeth. And I've often um, just kind of breezed through this, and as I've been studying both this and later passages that we'll come to in Matthew it struck me that uh, in our day and age, we, we don't understand lamentation uh, all that well, the idea of a lament, but I think um, it's easy to uh, essentially understand the words that Jesus is saying, but it's hard to hear the way in which he's saying them. And my encouragement to us today is to maybe consider that Jesus, in these passages that we've read, is really lamenting. He is speaking out of Uh, this idea of a lament. Um, William Dyer, I quoted this a couple weeks ago. He says, uh, meditate often on these four last things, death, which is most certain, judgment, which is most strict, hell, which is most doleful, and heaven, which is most delightful. Out of those four, which one would you prefer to dwell on? Right? Let's pick A, B, C, or D. And yet he says that we should go to hell by contemplation so as to avoid it by condemnation, that we should consider hell. We should consider what it is to be separated from the love of God. Uh, And so Lamentations is a book that helps us to do that, helps us to understand it. And I think it's difficult to understand Lamentations a little bit, and this has been a reflection I've had for a few weeks. I don't know if you know this, but I like classic uh, country and Western music. It's been my, it's one of my passions. Um, and when we were coming back from Montana, uh, there was uh, more than just me in the car, so we were listening to different music, and we were listening to some mod- more modern country music. My kids listened to some of that, and I've always struggled with it. I don't really like it. I don't know if it's just the style, but uh, as I was contemplating it, I thought, you know what classical country western music has that modern music does not? Lament. There is a, a genre of singing, and we think of it as sad, right? I mean, there's the old joke, what happens if you take a country western record and play it backwards? You get your dog back, and you get your <laughs> truck back, and you get your wife back. Um, but there is this kind of uh, reputation that classic country music has that it's depressing, that it's sad, that it's just about drinking and that kind of thing. And it is. Uh, But what I noticed is that in modern music, and not just country music, but in general, there is not a genre of true lament. If you actually were to go back, it's not just about drinking or the the joys of drinking. Actually, it's there's a tear in my beer. Because I'm crying for you, dear. You are on my... You guys are laughing, but that's a... You can't laugh at Hank Williams Sr. Uh, George Jones is my favorite. He is a great lamenter. If you're looking for a good lament, the blues only sung in country and western, George Jones is a good place to start. Whether it's the Grand Tour, anybody here know this song, the Grand Tour? Just curious. 
I'm hitting nobody except... Yeah, I know. I see you, Mike. Charlie, I know. I got two of you. That's good. Good enough. He says, if drinking don't kill me, her memory will. I can't hold out much longer the way that I feel. With the blood from my body, I could start my own still. If drinking don't kill me, her memory will. There is a sense in which the old country songs give us something to lament. It actually leaves us in this place of sadness. It's not a celebration of these things. It is a a sadness of recognition of that we have loss, that things go badly, that I am sad about the turn of events that have taken place, much of which is my own doing, much of which is my own fault. And so I think there is something about learning lament that is difficult in our culture is all I would like to say. All of that was just a pretext to say that. And that there is something that the people of God the Israelites had learned through these traditions and through books like Lamentations and the Psalms of actually learning to sing songs of sorrow, to cry out before, the God, before God about the current situation that they have. And Lamentations helps us to do that. So let's look at it real carefully, well, at least fairly quickly, but try to draw out from Lamentations 1 some of these ideas. So verses 1 through 5 we see this image of a desolate woman, a woman who has lost her husband, who has lost uh, something great. I think of Merle Haggard's song, Are the Good Times Really Over for Good, right? This song of lament, he says, look at the city, how great it once was. I have a memory of the bustling city of Jerusalem and all of its splendor and people coming and singing and great festivals, and now it is deserted with tumbleweeds rolling in the streets, and it's empty, and it's haunted. Uh, I, the only way I can think to illustrate this image that he puts out of, of the people of Israel and their city, Jerusalem, I had an experience that I've shared before, and some of you will be uh, a newer, or uh, you haven't heard this story before, so I'm going to share it again. Uh, Heidi and I lived in uh, Hungary for two years uh, when we were first married. Our kids were very little. Meryl was just a few months old. And when we got there, we were kind of young and dumb and just were involved with this little church plant. And in this church plant, there was these two little girls. They were gypsy girls from the kind of poor part of town, and they had been friends with a previous missionary there. And so they were kind of just around, and we uh, got to know them really well. And they hung out with and helped watch our kids and And uh, the younger one probably wasn't more than about around 12 years old when we got there. Um, And so we spent two years with them. And she was one of my favorite people in the world. She had so much laughter and life and just what you would imagine a funny little 12-year-old kid would be like. Uh, By the time we had left, things had changed. And she had grown up a little bit and started going to the clubs. And we were concerned about this, but we had come home to the States and had finished our our term as short-term missionaries there. We went back to visit, and over the course of just a few years, she had had two children with a a man who was abusive, and she had um, probably experienced more sorrow and pain in her life than I have to this day in mine in just a few short years. And the thing that I noticed when we went to see our friend, is that there was a deadness in her eyes, that they had lost all of that life. And I didn't know what to do. I honestly left absolutely um, without any sense of, what do I do, God? I don't know how to help. I don't know how to fix it. All I could do was lament and be sad at these circumstances. I felt absolutely helpless. And I think there's a sense in which The author of Lamentations is tapping into this helplessness that we have when we see that which was good utterly destroyed by sin and brokenness and the world in which we live. And so verses 5, if we were to go down through verses 5 through 9, it says, Her foes have become her master, her enemies are at ease. The Lord has brought her grief because of her many enemies. 
sins. This is um, an important uh, issue in, at the end of verse 5 and then into verse 6 where he says, All the splendor has departed from daughter Zion. Her princes are like deers that, that find no pasture. In weakness they have fled before their pursuer. In the days of her affliction and wandering, Jerusalem remembers all the treasures that were hers in the days of old. And in verse 8, it says, Jerusalem has sinned greatly and so become unclean. Lamentations invites us to, to look at sin and the ugliness of it, the sinfulness of sin, that God hates sin. And when we see the brokenness in our world or the brokenness in our lives or the brokenness that is broadly uh, experienced in the world, there should be the response not to be proud, but to lament, not to shake our fists in the air, but to be moved towards the sadness. Why? Because God hates sin. And we see that in verses 10 through 15, where we see the wrath of God made evident in the life of his people. Verse 10 says, The enemy laid hands on all her treasures. What are these treasures, by the way? And certainly we, as Christians, need to remember the treasures that we have, the goodness of Christ, the joy of salvation, his mercy. And yet often we, and, and, and broadly speaking, the church forgets the treasures that were of the olden days and are tempted to walk away from God and to sin. And so we see the enemy coming into the assembly where it is meant for God's people, and they come and they make it unclean. In verse 11, it says, All her people groan as they search for bread. They barter their treasures for food to keep themselves alive. Look, Lord, and consider, for I am despised. This is nothing to you. Is this nothing to you? All you who pass by, look around and see, is any suffering like my suffering that was inflicted on me, that the Lord has brought on me in the day of his fierce anger. We're reminded of Psalm 18, where David says, the Lord is my refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. But he also reminds us in the center of that Psalm in verse Seven, that the earth trembles and quakes and the foundations of the mountain shook. They trembled because God was angry. He hates the sin which plagues his creation. We actually can look down um, a few verses and we see that in verse 14, my sins have been bound into a yoke by his hand. They were we woven together. They have been hung on my neck, and the Lord has sapped my strength. Throughout Lamentations 1, there is this deep recognition of the sinfulness of sin and how it weighs a heavy burden on the human condition. And God's people in Jerusalem had consistently, time after time, walked away from God and continued in their open rebellion. And so we see that it is God's hand of judgment that comes upon them. Before we look at that, I would just say as a side note that when we see that my sin has been bound in a yoke, what does that remind you of? We sang about it. Matthew 11, when Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke. What is, God, what is Jesus' yoke? It is the yoke of righteousness. It is the yoke of that righteousness that he demonstrates and lives out perfectly, which we'll come back to. But let's continue down through this lam lamentation. This Really, it's, a, I think, a, a song that is an acrostic uh, one letter, beginning of each stanza for each letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And it continues on that God has given me into the hands of those who, cannot, who I cannot withstand. I think this is what Jesus 
is lamenting. He understands that the people of Israel, that God is going to bring his judgment. Lamentations is written, if you didn't know, after the Babylonians had destroyed the city of Jerusalem. And uh, it was a, um, a terrible time in their history in which Nebuchadnezzar came in and he basically, the kings kept rebelling against his taxes and so he finally said, I'm done with these people of Judea and I'm going to uh, basically force them into submission. They were constantly playing with his enemies and, and, and so um, he comes in and destroys the temple, takes the people, massacres, and there was a, a, a large siege and people starved to death. It was a horrible time for the people living in Jerusalem. And we might think, okay, what God did was God kind of stepped back and he just kind of let Nebuchadnezzar go. But that's not what actually the Bible tells us. The Bible in 2 Kings, and and it's worth maybe just taking a moment going there, in verse uh, 18 of chapter 24 in, in the second book of Kings, It says, Zedekiah was 21, he was the last king, old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 11 years. And it gives his mother's name and daughter and and her history. But it says in verse 19 that uh, Zedekiah did evil in the eyes of the Lord, just as Jehoiakim had done. And then verse 20, it was because of the Lord's anger that all this happened to Jerusalem and Judah. And in the end, he, God, thrust them from his presence. Now Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon, so that God's hand in his anger comes against his people to discipline them. And he destroys them through Nebuchadnezzar. We actually see this even more in 2 Chronicles 36 where it says in verse 17, he brought up against them, that's God brought up against his people, the king of the Babylonians, who killed their young men with the sword in the sanctuary and did not spare young men or young women, the elderly or the infirm. God gave them all into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. He carried to Babylon all the articles from the temple of God, both large and small, and the treasures of the Lord's temple and the treasures of the king and his officials. They set fire to God's temple and broke down the wall of Jerusalem. They burned all the palaces and destroyed everything of value there. This is what Lamentations is referring to. It's saying that God's people had all of this treasure. They had God in their presence. They had a means by which they would live in the very presence of God, and God came and took it all away. He destroyed it. because they continued to sin. In fact, if we go back a little further, listen to what 2 Chronicles 36, 15 says. The Lord, the God of their ancestors, sent word to them through his messengers again and again, because he had pity on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked God's messengers, despised his word, and scoffed at his prophets, until the wrath of God was aroused against his people and there was no remedy. And so we see God's mercy time and time again. He brings his prophets. And Jesus actually tells this parable of the, uh, the, you know, the guy who owns a guy, I can't remember what a guy who owns a grape vineyard is, vineyardist or whatever he is. But he sends uh, workers, right? And he sends messenger after messenger, and then he finally says, I'll send my son, and they'll respect him. And and Jesus is referring to the fact that Israel, in God's grace, has given them time and time again. The gospel is preached over and over and over again. And yet, Christ is despised, is rejected, is mocked, and cast aside. Jesus as he is speaking, understand something about lamentations. He's, he's, he's speaking to the people, Matthew. He understands what happened during the time of the Babylonian exile. And he looks out at, at Jerusalem and the people who are gathered around him in Judea, and he knows something. It's going 
to happen again. In this generation, Jesus says, you will see it again. And the Romans will come in and almost to a T execute the exact same strategy as the Babylonians and will destroy the second temple in 70 AD and starve the people out. And it will be a terrible and dreadful day. And yet, before this takes place, what does God do? He sends his son to step in between, to step in between God's wrath and his people who have rebelled over and over again. Lamentations reminds us that we are not on this, you know, a question that often philosophers might ask is, what is the trajectory of civilization? Are we on this kind of trajectory to, when I was a kid, we watched a show called Jetsons. It was, it was a rerun when I was a kid, just so you know. Uh, but it was this show where it gave us this image that through science and through human ingenuity, we would all be flying around in airplanes and have maids that, would, that were robots and cooked our meals and vacuumed for us. We, you know, and we've barely been able in all this time to make a robot that actually vacuums the floor. And it's really not that impressive <laughs> compared to what the Jetsons have. I'm like, we got to get better at these robot vacuums or we're not going to get to flying cars anytime soon. The other is that humans will continue the cycle of violence and war. And they will always find themselves back in war. And in fact, uh, one of the things that has happened in, in the United States is some of our greatest uh, times of revival in this country came after our greatest war. It was the, after the Civil War that we actually saw some great awakenings where people began, I think, in lament, turning to God, recognizing their need. It was during the Civil War that the Battle Hymn of the Republic was penned, which starts, Mine eyes have seen the coming of the glory of the Lord. Because as the author looked and saw our country being torn apart and brother killing brother and blood being shed like no other war has ever happened before or since in the United States. And yet in the middle of that, what does it say? Mine eyes have seen the coming of the glory of the Lord. Who's what? trampling down the vineyards where the grapes of wrath are stored. In fact, that idea of grapes of wrath is found here in Lamentations and in Revelation. Jesus says, one day, Jerusalem, you will experience it again. The Romans will come in and they will destroy it. And afterwards, John will look ahead and he will get a vision and and be able to tell us it will happen again. God's wrath is coming which is a very sombering and difficult message to deliver. Were it not for just this little verse that I want us um, to attend to. In verses 16 and 17, we just really see, this is why I'm sad, this is why I weep, and my eyes overflow with tears. No one is near to comfort me, no one to restore my spirit. My children are destitute because the enemy has prevailed. What sadness. In fact, I I wonder sometimes if this hopelessness is what John felt when he looked upon the cross and saw the Savior beaten, torn up, skin torn apart and lacerated from the beatings, bleeding on the cross. And it would seem that the Romans and the religious leaders and all those who hated Christ had won. Hopeless. He dies. They take him down. They bury him just like you bury a dead person. And what are his disciples doing except probably spending a lot of time weeping, crying, feeling absolutely helpless and hopeless? But in verse 18, there's just this little phrase. It says in verse 18, the Lord is righteous. The Lord is righteous. This is the most important statement in in the lament 
that God is righteous, but Jesus is righteous. Yet, I rebelled. I rebelled against His command. We are not the victims of sin. We are the perpetrators of sin. This is not an easy message in our day and age. In fact, the idea of victimhood has become kind of a a politically charged idea. But Christians have this deep, and and really it, it goes back into the Old Testament, this deep and abiding sense that we receive punishment for our sins, that we receive what is due us, that all our suffering, all our slavery, all our bad stuff is that which is poured out onto us justly. There is only one who has suffered real injustice, and that is the person of Christ who was righteous, and he suffered the most. Listen, all you people. Look on my suffering. My young men and young women have gone into exile. I call to my allies, but they betray me. My priests and my elders perish in the city while they search for food to keep themselves alive. We see this deep suffering. And it is not a call to to be stoic, not a call to be tough. In fact, it is not a call to any kind of pride, but it is a call to lament, both at the sadness of sin and the way in which we participate. Yet I rebelled against his command. Verse 20 says, See, the Lord, how distressed I am. I am in torment within. In my heart I am disturbed, for I have been most rebellious. And so when we get to the final verses, verse 22, it says, Let all their wickedness come before you. Deal with them as you have dealt with me because of all my sins. My groans are many, and my heart is faint. There is a call, first and foremost, that God's righteousness would be defended. God, may your righteousness be that which is elevated, and may sin be dealt with. Well, that puts us in a difficult position, doesn't it? And yet David helps us. In Psalm 51, after he was caught in his uh, terrible sin, he says in verse 5, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Notice his repentance is not just simply, Lord, I made a mistake. I tripped up this, I did this one thing, I shouldn't have done that one thing, and that other thing too, or these three things. He says, God, I don't know how to plumb to the depth to find out why it is that I've continued to rebel against you. Though you have poured out your blessing on me time and time again, I still find in my heart this rebellious nature. What can I do? Well, he answers that question a little bit later in verse 7 and 9. He says, cleanse me with the hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. You see, lamenting is helpful for us. To avoid it is actually to cheapen God's grace. When we don't understand what it was that Jesus did when he stepped down into this world, when he stepped in front of God's wrath at the cross and took upon himself what we deserve, then we really don't understand what it means to be saved. We might think, oh, I just, you know, ask God a little forgiveness here, a little forgiveness there. I say a prayer, and then I'm good, and I'm ready to go. But that's not what the Scriptures actually teach us. It teaches us that by lamenting, we begin to understand what it is that we need to be saved from. And by lamenting, we then are opened up to this idea of God's grace, how good it is, how wonderful it is, what a blessing it is. So that 
Isaiah tells us, puts it this way, and we'll kind of close with this thought. Isaiah 53.10 says, Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. What Isaiah saw was that one would come who did not deserve God's wrath, but would take upon himself God's wrath, that he would be crushed and he would suffer. And it says in verse 11, after he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. And by his knowledge or by the knowledge of him, my righteous servant will do what? Will justify many. And he will bear their iniquities, their sins. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Lamentations teaches us how wonderful Christ's redemptive act on the cross was for us, how great it was, how much it covers. When we look at the world around us, it is okay to lament and be sad. We are, I think, in a time in our country of great rebellion against God and his word. Though the gospel is preached time and time again, it is often rejected time and time again. But it should cause us not only to lament at the sad state of our society, but to also then look to the glorious grace of Christ, which is still present today, which is still being offered, which is still readily available to each and every one of us should we receive it with gladness. Jesus Christ has stepped in front of the disaster, which is God's wrath, which is coming. And when we come to him, he shields us from it. He takes off the yoke of our sin, and he places on the yoke of his righteousness. And he makes us ready for a kingdom where he will reign, where all sin is ultimately destroyed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word this morning. I pray that by it you would build up our faith, that you would sharpen our minds. We have received in fullness, your mercy at the table this morning and your grace. I pray that you would, by your word, teach us to lament, to hate sin the way you hate it in our life, in our society, around us. And in the same way that it would turn us, just as David turned to you, for forgiveness and grace, that we might find joy, that we might find gladness, that we might find hope. In your name, amen.